Ryan. Hi, how you doing? Hey, hey buddy. Very well. This is Jay and Mike. Hi, Jay. I'm Mike. Hey, buddy. How are you, Ryan? It's good to uh, good to talk to you. Thanks for calling in. Uh, of course, this is Ryan, Ryan Ridley, you. writer, producer, voice actor for Rick and Morty and Ghosted and Community. More importantly, uh, the son of Mark Ridley, our, our dear friend Mark Ridley, owner of uh, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle in Royal Oak. Um, how, was, uh, how was Mark as a, as a dad for you growing up? How was he? <laughs> he charged me a cover <laughs> and a two-drink minimum <laughs> every time I came home. So, you know, he's kind of always had that business sensibility that yeah. it takes to run, run a comedy club. Well, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with us at all, Ryan, but we, I've known your dad for, shit, 17, 18 years now. And, uh, I mean, such, such a legendary club. Great guy. We've actually had him in studio here. Did a, he did a great interview with us. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he's, he's great. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I'm learning about my dad and me is that I – I take after my mom when it comes to uh, a lot of my personality because I remember my dad growing up, I'd, I'd always be you know out and about with him, running errands or at restaurants, and he would know everybody by name. Yeah, and uh, I'm like, and I just thought as a kid, I'm like, well, I, I guess you're just friends with everybody when you're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> if you're friends with the person at the bank and the, the lady at the grocery store. No, and your dad is just older, an extraordinarily just like, nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I did not take after him at all. I, you know, I think I think once I uh, once I get to know you, I'm very friendly. But boy, it's the most terrifying thing in the world to ask the name of someone that I I've seen. Even even if I see them, Ugh. you know, every day getting a cup of coffee, I God forbid I ask their name. Dude, I, I'm the same way. It kills me. It's like I know I've met this guy a thousand times. God, this is awful. I should know his name. Well, it it's yeah. fun, it's funny too because your your dad like. Um, when, when you talk to like, uh, comics, I don't care who they are. They all have horror stories about clubs across from coast to coast horror stories. And then you ask them about Mark Ridley or Ridley's comedy castle. And they just, they can't say enough good things about it. They, they absolutely love him and love that club. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty cool. Cause I, I hear that too. And I always go, boy, I hope people are just telling me that. Cause you know, <laughs> no, he's my dad. No, 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 not uh, at all. So it's cool. It's cool that he uh, he one of the few good ones in apparently industry full of uh, sleaze balls. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> hey, how much time did you spend around the club uh, growing up? I mean, every comedian who's anybody has gone through that club. Any any favorites that you got to see? Any stories? Yeah, I mean, I always tell I've told this story so many times because it was the most impactful. I mean, I, I growing up, I I definitely saw a lot. I was there a lot, and you know, at a certain age, I probably didn't know who anybody was. And also at the same time, a lot of the people I saw at that point weren't famous. So uh, who knows exactly who I saw, but um, I definitely, you know, Tim Allen was around growing up and uh, I, my dad tells me I saw Empire Strikes Back with Bob Saget. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember that. Um, and then, I, but the biggest one was I got to see Jim Carrey for my 16th birthday with a group of my friends. And that was, at the sweet spot where it was just after in living color. So obviously I knew him from that, but it was just before Ace Ventura came out. So he, he was just, he was such a huge influence on my comedic sensibility because he was so absurd. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and just his energy he had was so not like a typical comedian and he was hilarious. And backstage he was hilarious even, you know, like he just was, he was Jim Carrey both on and off stage. So that was pretty special. Now you've done stand up yourself at Ridley's. Is that right? Yeah. I had, I had a really traumatic experience. I started <laughs> doing stand up. Um, you're going to get me to cry. You guys, uh, I, uh, I did stand up early on just because, you know, it's funny to think like pre internet being as, uh, easily accessible and being able to, kind of dis- disseminate whatever you want nowadays like before that like there was just not it wasn't easy to get to get stuff out there you know if you didn't mm. have a platform so i was like well geez i know i can write jokes and then i can get on a stage and say them and that's sort of like the the only way to mainline something to an audience and get feedback um so i was doing stand-up in, around town and i sort of kind of slowly built up like Oh, I was doing these little, you know, bar, these little bar back rooms. And I kind of, you know, start doing well. I go, well, I'm not going to do my dad's club until I get 
So I get real good. <laughs> and uh, one day, uh, a headliner came in and saw me at this show where I was sort of the big fish in the small pond. And he was like, oh, you got to come middle for me. So he came and he, he I had, uh, it was my first paid gig at my dad's club. I opened for this guy. And boy, it was just, I just bombed in every show. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I can't tell you. Probably some of the most uncomfortable moments in my life are being in your dad's club and watching someone absolutely shit the bed on stage. And it's, I don't know why some people like watching people die like that, but it just, I want to just slink under the table. I'm so embarrassed Have for him. Have empathy for him. Yes, right? totally. Yeah, I, I can't stand it. I, I, I would much rather be in the hands of someone who, Either handles bombing with grace or just hundred percent kills it. Like I don't want to see suffering, yeah, <laughs> and humiliation and shame. Yeah, it's so tough. Whenever I see a comic, and the and the hardest part for them is to transition between jokes. Like I think that's the that's what takes a bad comic to a decent comic is when you can do that because they've got it in their head that they're about to get a big laugh, and then when that doesn't come, they don't really have a transition into their next topic. And so it's that really uncomfortable, like, oh, so, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like in a movie when you could tell that they built in a, a laugh break in the edit. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. I find it interesting, too, Ryan, for your career. You know, you want to get into comedy. You want to get into, into writing. And, you know, your dad owns this humongous club uh, here in town. And, and yet you were like, I got to get out of here. And so you went to Chicago. And that's kind of where you started yeah. to, to make your own name. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, not much of a name in Chicago, but, you know, that was sort of, I, I was doing stand-up at Detroit for a while, and I, I just knew I had to kind of get to that next stage, uh, so to speak. So, yeah, I moved to Chicago, and and I really fell in love with the the, comedi- the comedy scene there. Like, I just, there was one night I went to a show at the Second City, and, and just, it was, I mean, it was one of those very, very alt-comedy weird experimental scenes but that just spoke to me and and i i was like oh i gotta become a part of this and so yeah moved there and started doing stand up there which is interesting is that is that hard to get into because we all it seems like there are always these packs of people that come out of second city whether it's toronto or or especially chicago where it's like yeah you know i was in a class with you know chris farley and this guy and, and you know all of them is that hard to get into or easy to get into i mean it seems like so much talent comes out of there Meaning just breaking into a scene in Chicago? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, it, it was hard because I didn't know anybody, literally. Like, I just moved there and was and, and said, okay, well, I have to – let me look up where all the comedy rooms are. And obviously, more importantly, the open mics because no one's going to book me at that point. And, uh, and I just, you know, was confident enough in myself that I was decent enough at a certain level that if I, you know, did it enough, I'd get – hopefully people's attention and and that's that's all i ask whenever anyone asks me for advice that's like the only advice i can give is like just get in the mix with like a scene of people that you respect creatively and, and, and you know connect with them and so just coming around to shows enough eventually you have a good you have finally have like a good set and then a couple people come up to you afterwards and, and, and tell you good job and then you start having a conversation and, and then you connect with them and then they're your friends and then now you've got a couple friends and that, that starts growing and and you're getting better and then they go, oh, you should do this show. And suddenly you've got both yeah. a friendship circle and a sort of a little a little, uh, a little network going. Yeah, yeah. It's like as long yeah. as one of as long as one of us makes it, you can pull the rest of us along with you. Talk- yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> obviously you got to be talented. That's the sure. truth. I was just explaining this the other day. To, I, 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 I was talking to somebody. I was like, unfortunately, in these, whenever I've been in like a comedy scene or something. Uh, whether it's stand up or, you know, making videos, which led me to TV writing and even in TV writing rooms, it's like people always end up being a, a gravitating to the people who they respect creatively. And then if they like them as people, that's sort of like secondary. It's never like, oh, you seem like a really good person. And, you, oh, you volunteer on the weekends. Wow. <laughs> uh, but you're not great at comedy. You're not talented. Right. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> hey, talk about the transition then to Channel 101 um, and the importance of that to you and your peers' development. Uh, Channel 101 is created by Dan Harmon, who created Rick and Morty and Community, and Rob Schraub, who directs a lot of TV comedy. And they 
were frustrated because they'd been writing a lot of stuff that never actually got made. And so they created this community that was like, oh, we'll just make our own stuff for people. And it was right early on. It was weird because, as I described earlier, it was hard to get your stuff out there pre-internet, becoming a huge distribution hub for anybody. And uh, and so they would have a website, and they they put up these videos. But but before that, they would screen them, and the, the the process was, it was emulating television. So the audience was essentially the network executives. You would you would make shows, meaning like pilots, like five minute little mini short pilots that had to have some sort of hook, like oh this is a cop show. So every week I could see a new adventure with these cops or whatever. And then, then the panel would put them in. So there'd be some quality control and there'd be 10, 10 shorts and the audience would vote on their top five. And those five would get to come back to make second episodes. So there could be shows that ran five to 10 to 20 episodes. And then there's others that, that screen one, and that's it. They don't come back mm-hmm. and that's considered a failed pilot. So Anyway, all that being said, it was a great process to just submit stuff and a get rejected first, obviously, and then get get stuff in, which means you were getting better, but get rejected by the audience and not get voted back. And then eventually they vote you back, and you're like, okay, I'm finally starting to crack it. Yeah. And then maybe you get canceled after the second episode, and then eventually you figure out how to make a show that goes for you know X amount up until basically you want to end it, which I finally got to that point. And it was just a great place to like hone my skills as far as crafting stories and everything else. And so did Rick and Morty come out of that? I mean, was there like a, a loosely based pilot that uh, Dan and Justin did that came out of that Channel 101? Just Justin. He had, he had done something called the House of Cosby's, which is hilarious. and sort of got him a lot of attention early on, and but also including Bill Cosby, who, boy, looking back, I mean, the, guy, the fact that that guy was on his high road. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Dude, it set the season to desist, so he stopped making it, and then he made something called "The Real Adventures of Doc and Marty," uh, which was blatantly and egregiously meant to be a Back to the Future ripoff. Sure. I mean, they weren't pretending to be anything else, except it was like in that. Am I allowed to 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 to, to speak crudely on sure. this? Oh Absolutely. God, yeah. Feel free. Say anything you want. So in that that it was it was obviously straight up Doc and Marty for Back to the Future, except Doc made Marty lick his balls repeatedly, <laughs> and I, and and I, I believe it was that There's was how the they twist. traveled through time. There's always a twist. Yeah, it, it was Justin going Marty. Marty, you gotta lick my balls, Marty. You gotta lick my oh boy, Rick, do I, Marty, do I have to, do I have to? And then he'd drop his pants and it'd be this gross like close-up of testicles and then a little boy <laughs> anyway so that all t- was was designed to in justin's mind get more negative attention this time from robert zemeckis for for universal because he was like well fuck it i pissed you know i got my show shut off that any he was making a trip giving a tribute to bill cosby he never was he wasn't making fun of us so this he's like i'm gonna go all in and uh, it never got a. See, it actually never got voted back. Apparently, the audience didn't. Uh, <laughs> was ahead of its time. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! That's so funny, man. Yeah. Um. So then. Yeah. So so then, how did how did you get involved? I mean, we're kind of jumping around here, but how did you get involved with Rick and Morty? We, you know, I'm, I'll be honest with you, Ryan. I'm kind of new to it. I, I'm, I'm almost through season one. It's a, it's a great show. It really is. So but good. I think we see your name first pop up in season one, episode three, I believe. And and I don't know if you're credited as a co- co-producer or something. Um, so so how did you get involved? You know, at at that stage. Uh, well, technically, I was episode two. Oh, was it? That's, okay. That's yeah. So I I uh, was the first writer they hired, and when the pilot got, I'm a voice in the pilot, so I only involvement in the pilot. And the bully who gets uh, frozen in school. Oh and, yeah, yeah, and yeah Frank. Tip over and and break it up several chunks. And uh, and so that was my only involvement in the pilot. I've been working with those guys for so many years and so many different things. Justin and I did a podcast for years. Dan and I did a web series, and um, I'd worked on a TV show with both of them. And uh, so I, you know, I I'd proven myself to them. I was we all shared a clearly shared a creative sensibility, and uh, so I guess I was I, I was either just 
always around and up in their shit or they they really valued me or a combination of both but they they brought me on as the first writer mm-hmm. and uh and that was that was when the show just got to scripts order that's it they wasn't picked up the series officially so we sat in a room and we wrote the first two episodes which were lawnmower dog which is my first credited episode i think that was the second one that aired and then uh the episode that aired kind of halfway through the season called love or rick potion number nine where morty and rick like fuck up the world so badly and Cronenberg everyone that they have to go to another reality at the end. That's mm-hmm. a great one. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by this and I've asked other people the same question, but when we see your credits pop up each week and it's like, Oh, this week uh, it's written by Ryan Ridley and, and next week, maybe you're a producer. And then the next week, maybe you're a co-producer. And I'm always wondering what, what that means. What is the difference in, I mean, obviously I know the difference between a writer and a producer, but why do those things change? And what does that all mean? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, a good question because it was always confusing for me. In fact, I, I've become so savvy now at reading credits and being like, oh, I know exactly what that person does. Mm, yeah. Uh, so uh, the long and the short of it is uh, it's – is that the right expression, the long and the short I of it? I believe it is, yeah. I, I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm giving credit uh, for that one. So all those – most of those producer titles are simply just writers and the, the arbitrary – random wording like supervising producer co-producer co-executive producer simply has to do with the uh pay grade slash (laughs) hierarchy where they fall in the hierarchy so for example like a staff right once you get producer by your name that's where you start getting getting higher level but it's you know staff writer then your uh story editor then you're an executive story editor, then wow. producer, then co-producer, then supervising producer, <laughs> then co-executive producer, and finally executive producer. And, you know, it just means who, how you get paid and, and how – if you're in charge of anyone else below you, basically. So you want to be an executive producer, if, if at all possible. Oh, of course. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. You, you always want more money and more power. Sure, sure. That's human nature. I would agree with that. That's the top of the food chain. <laughs> But those titles, they don't change weekly for any individual. They're they're seasonally. So you do a whole season as one kind of writer producer, and then you get promoted to the next title and so on. So how does the writing process work on Rick and Morty? Do you work on individual ideas and then bring it to a group on a selected date and everybody collaborates and molds it into a final product? Or I mean how I I'd say I'd say Rick and Morty works basically the same as any other T V show animated or, or live action, as far as I know, where at least any scripted show because there are animated shows that are quote board driven which basically means ideas are generated which i guess this is the same they're they're same at this at this level most tv shows the room sits all the writers sit in a room together and pitch ideas and you know it's anything from ideas that they had yeah worked on at home individually and wrote down in a notebook and then came in and just said something as simple as like oh rick turns into a tomato i hate it but what if he turned into a pickle yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> to, you know, to something more um, fully fleshed out. And, and then you basically just sit in a room and obviously the head, the, the head writer slash executive producer, if you're the writer, is driving the, the leading everything. So the arbiter of what is what works and what doesn't work. And then and then the things that they gravitate towards can, uh, and, and think that has potential. Then we start to focus in on those ideas and start building out those ideas. And then as those ideas get bigger and bigger, then eventually they're assigned to a single writer, sometimes arbitrarily, sometimes because they pitch the idea, sometimes because they're just like, hey, I really love this idea. I, have a, I know I can nail it. And then that person goes off and writes the outline. And then after that, they wrote the, the first draft. And after that, you know, second or third draft, depending. And then eventually the executive producer, head writer, somebody does a pass on it to kind of make it uniform with the with the whole show as far as the sensibility and and then when is the interplay then with art directors i mean do you do you give them ideas the whole time during this process and they're exchanging things with you you're kind or are, are the writers sketching characters out in terms of what they're thinking in their minds justin always would do that he'd get on the whiteboard and start writing you know if he had an idea in his head i mean the worst thing was was what we found out was the most frustrating thing in the world is to like when justin has an idea in his head for a character and he goes like i really want to see this kind of thing and it draws a big creature usually that has like testicle jowls or something like that (laughs) and now we're kind of locked into like making a story around something that looks a specific way which is always like this might be a terrible example but like 
hey, you're trying to figure out how to make the engine go fast and, and fuel efficient. Well, like, just make sure that it also can power the headlights shaped like stars. And you're like, what? <laughs> Let me get to that way down the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it, sometimes it helps. It drives and you're, you're inspired and stuff like that. But the interviewing you know, artist was, I don't know, like, like, maybe it could have been a little more integrated and stuff, but usually it was after the episode is written, you go and you take it to the uh, art director and they start breaking it down and uh, assigning things to character designers or prop designers of background or whatever. And they would start depicting the world. And boy, sometimes it would be so off what you expect it to be. And that mm-hmm. would be a, that could be a great thing. It'd be like, Oh, I didn't even picture this alien to look like this, but this is cool. Or sometimes it'd be like, no, no, no. Yeah. got to look like this. You've got to <laughs> have a big head and a little body. <laughs> yeah. The art is so important in the show. It, it, it's a cartoon. Unlike say the Simpsons, that's just set in Springfield or wherever right, the hell that right. is. I mean, you guys are jumping dimensions and all this stuff. So yeah, I would, yeah. I would think they come back with some stuff where you're just like, wow, nah. that's not at all what I was thinking when I was thinking of this world with, you know, yeah. uh, aliens with huge testicle heads. I, I yeah, know. I mean, I, one time, the, 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 the best story I could think of, is, well, there's two good stories. One I think I've told a lot, but the one I haven't told as much is, is I wrote this, ep- I wrote this, I didn't even write the episode. I wasn't titled as credited as the writer, but I'd written like a, a big chunk of it. And uh, there's a scene where they go to a, a, a world and and I described them as as tree people and you know what I meant was simply they were like humanoid creatures although aliens that lived in the woods and sort of lived a more ar- ar- arboreal lifestyle and and the designs were they were literally like trees like with yeah. like from Wizard of Oz They're like tree beard tree beard, tree beard from whatever. Lord of the like, Rings yeah 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 and I'm just like no no <laughs> it's not this is ruining the joke they've got to be like humanoid and it really I don't know if I came off like a dick but it's like you got to fight for what's right cuz these things matter you know and the way that a, a an entire product comes together like it's got to feel it's got to work on every level or else like something's just gonna it's gonna fall apart if, if you get if you just get way too off the, what the, the is intended to be mm-hmm. you know I, I i understand that this is really your dream job sci-fi and comedy it's the perfect mix for you and i don't know how really to ask this question but whenever i think of sci-fi i know how fans can get really really super into that stuff they get really big cult followings and your show's no different I wonder how important it is for you guys to for the stuff to make sense technically when you're talking about different worlds. I mean, I imagine nerds are going to come up and go, that wouldn't work because the third dimension would fall apart for, you know, due to X. So do you guys even think yeah. about that or is it just like, ah, fuck it, whatever. We just write what we want and go there. The latter. <laughs> the ah, fuck it school of yeah. writing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I always heard Futurama were a staff of math. Nerds, yeah, geniuses. Nerds and and people with engineering degrees and physics backgrounds, and they really worked to to get all that stuff right. I'm like, who is the time for that? I mean, because the truth is, in 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 most of the movies I've loved as a kid, I mean, all that that sci-fi is it doesn't really hold up. It's just like, does it hold up from a from a story logic point of view? Meaning, like, we all know when we're watching a movie and someone explains something, we're like, what? That's stupid versus like, yeah, I don't know. That seems right. <laughs> that <Yeah>. sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Which is, by the way, every time travel movie, like because time travel isn't real and no one knows if it's possible. <laughs> All time travel is is made up logic, but just some time travel movies seem to feel right. And others just go like, what? I'm too distracted by all the paradoxes and traits. Yeah. And so as long as the story stuff feels right, I mean, the, I've gotten really frustrated at jobs where people point out logic issues and I go, trust me when I tell you this, and this is not me not being like, hey, nobody cares, but nobody's going to care about that little bit of logic if they're entrusted by a story that's internal story logic, which is very different from real world logic. You can't build an airplane on story logic and hope it flies. Yeah. Uh, you know, people aren't going to care because, but if the story's not working because we're, we're spending too much time focused on the detail, then all they're going to care about is, wait, what? That's dumb. That doesn't make sense because they're not caught up in the story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, Ryan, I saw you commenting. I think recently you guys were at a Comic-Con. I know you probably have done several of those. Number one, I'm interested in your uh, take on Comic-Cons in general, but the substance of this discussion had to do with uh, female 
writers being included in season three. Oh, and I wondered, yeah. how did that change the creative dynamic? Um, it didn't. I mean, you know, it, it, as far as, you know, I always say, like, I don't like the whole the idea that women or, or men would change any dynamic in any room, I think, is less uh, of a factor than just the actual what 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 any of us hope to actually see, which is just the, the talent or the skill of the individual writer. Sure. So, you know, when you, we have we've had lots of writers and, and, and most of them are men because that's what most of the show has been that have, you know, not really worked out for one reason or another. And it's, it's not because they're untalented at all. Sometimes it's like anything from a personality difference to just like a sensibility difference. And so when we brought on, you know, female writers, it was like, well, this is truly an effort to just try to address these classic issues. Like, you know, white men tend to hire white men because they know mostly white men, you know? Right. And so we made an effort to kind of like mix it up. And like with the male writers we hired, we found out like, oh, some were better than others, fit in better than others, contributed certain things that were missing that, you know, that, 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 that we didn't realize. But I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive to say it had less to do with gender than it did just the individual talent for the, the people. So it had well, nothing to do with the absence of a penis or yeah. presence of a penis. Right. Interesting. You know, I mean, there was a couple times when, you know, all of a sudden you go, oh, this room bit maybe isn't really connecting with the ladies or maybe it's a little too – we're, we're yeah. assuming, we're forgetting that, that, that women don't think like this. I'm just talking about just like when we're just joking around in the room about something – gross you right, know right. it's like yeah. oh yes this suddenly feels weird <laughs> to yeah. be talking about this see but i would worry about that a little bit like you want that room that goes crazy off the walls you know a comedy writer's room can be nasty and if you're thinking about that like oh shit linda's sitting over there i hope i i hope i didn't just bum her out you know i, I, I don't know that'd be that'd be tough to uh well, to I, did, go I, there. I didn't hear him say that though i just heard him say that some people didn't connect like for example the women just didn't get the ball sweat joke or something like that i mean you're not oh, saying not even that <laughs> not even that i just remember i remember, I remember justin said uh there's a story where, where i don't know what we're talking about something to do with like this girl said like uh, and then like the guy would like come on her face and then justin was like yeah, that'd be gross. <laughs> like clearly, like <laughs> yeah. the subject being like, like oh, okay, who would want to like, do that? You know, oh man, all guys. This is the they call it the money shot for a reason. <laughs> uh, Boy, this whole room and, is you know, offended by that. But it wasn't even offended. It was just sort of like, oh, like yeah, she doesn't see pornography the same way that men see it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And and I don't think you know it was ever an issue of anyone having to to be concerned. I mean. You know, I also think that, look, there's there's a difference between aggressively macho or what you'd call like toxic masculine, like like joking around that, that does veer into like offensive. It's like, look, even I would be offended by because I've been in room two. I'm just like, look, guys, I could I love the grossest joke. I, I believe me like I but it's like there's also some, I've been around dudes. Where I'm like, oh, this is like sexist and misogynistic. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not into the the angle of this joke because, frankly, it's just dumb, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we ever had to mitigate that. And and you know, there was a famous lawsuit in the in the '90s with like a Friends, I think, writer's assistant that maybe sued because of that issue. And that basically a judge was like, "Look, the writers' rooms they have to be able to go to wherever they want on their creative journey to an idea." And yeah. you know. There's it basically it's like, yeah, you can't really censor yourself. Now, there's obviously a difference between straight up using that as a cover for sexual harassment and, and real creative indulgences in the uh, in the in, in wherever gross places your, your mind would go for well, I, as you're joking around. I just think it's a really risky move. I mean, kudos to you guys for doing it. But when you've got something that's working, you know, the, the adage of it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know. And so if you've got something that's going, you've got a couple seasons under your belt. It's really got a strong following. I mean, there's always the risk that you bring in four female writers and all of a sudden the field changes and fans notice it. And then what do you do? Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I had to say this a lot online and, and stuff and addressing it. But, like, honestly, the only, the only thing that's ever going to move the needle as far as the show is going to be Dan, Justin, and I'd like to think to a lesser extent me and another writer, Dan Guterman, another writer named Mike McMahon. We were always sort of the core – team and i don't want to leave out any other writers there's you know tom kaufman was a writer that was on the show from the beginning but when i name those names 
those are the people who were there from the beginning and were the sort of the loudest voices in the room. And truth is, those people are going to make up the largest 80% of the pie chart of, of the creative influence of the show. And so when you're bringing in other writers, and I don't care if they're male or female, because it really, I'm telling you, there were there were male writers who were detrimental to the show in many ways. And it's got nothing to do with gender. It's just like, oh, these are you take a you take a chance on a new person, and suddenly it's like, oh, they're not working out. They don't get the show, or they're like yeah. arguing too much, or they're on their phone. And so, yeah, the needle was was only ever going to move based on that think tank's sensibility. So, if the show, if the people criticized the, the third season, and I, I do think it was truly misogyny because they just look at the names on the screen of, right. of who wrote the episode that one sucked because it was a girl who wrote it. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it they don't understand how tv works uh those were episodes that that were ultimately decided by all of us and they were wrong also because pickle rick had the name of a, of a female writer and that just got nominated for an award i mean it's it just it was it was exposing a lot of ignorance about how TV writing works, and people start saying like the women are ruining the show. It's like, dude, yeah. you have no idea, that, uh, you know. So, are you guys working on season four right now? And if not, when when does that start? Uh, no, I'm actually I no one's as far as I know, no one's working on the show, and I'm certainly not. Uh, so I don't know what's going on. I haven't heard anything. Yeah, boy. And, uh, yeah, they really take their time. I, I never understood why everybody, all parties, Dan, Justin, and Adult Swim didn't get their shit together and make, <laughs> make the show fast. I just don't get it. It's, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sure they all have their reasons. But uh, Are you uh, saying there's a possibility there won't be a season four, or do you think there will be? I, I don't think there's... I, I I I highly doubt there won't be. I just I'm shocked that it's taken. We we got done writing season three in November of last year, and here we are, eleven months later. Wow. Um. Yeah. So it, it you know, and then and then and then I know how long the show takes to write, let alone animate. So it's just like it's it'd be I'd be surprised if there was a fourth season on the air any uh, sooner than 2019, than wow. late 2019. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's it's crazy. I yeah. I, I I just. Get your shit together, you guys. Get it all together. <laughs> Put it in a backpack, to quote Rick. Um, or you, Morty, sorry. That was Morty's line. Well, not not to stay too much on on uh, the writer's room and stuff like that, but I'm fascinated by it. And, and you know, we, we've got a show here, a talk show, and it's, it's kind of wide open. We talk about all types of stuff, and we try to make each other laugh as much as we can. It kind of reminds me of a writer's room. And nothing, yeah. nothing humiliates me more than when I say something, and I swear to God I thought of it on the spot, and then Eric goes, Map Seinfeld did that. Well, yep, yeah, that was like a Simpsons episode. And I'm like, fuck, I swear to God, I wasn't thinking about Seinfeld or The Simpsons. Mike is all day either coming up with stuff from Seinfeld, Simpsons, or he's using wordplay. That's, that's yeah, the that's, extent that's of the my humor. thing. So I imagine, like, if, yeah. I, if I had a great writer's idea and I come running into the writer's room, and I, I mean. Yeah, there's only so many chords on the yeah, guitar, you know? Exactly. I mean, how, how, how hard is it to really truly come up with something creative that everybody goes, holy shit, yeah, that's. And, and have you ever heard, Simpsons did it? No, oh, of course. I mean, uh, you know, Simpsons and I mean, not as much Seinfeld just because we're in such a different world. But, you know, South Park made a whole episode called Simpsons did it because they yeah. were experiencing that in their writer's room. So and Simpsons has been on for 20 years and, and also not just been on like in the background. It's been on. It was, it was such a fundamental part of all of our anyone who, who who's a writer, I think, grew up watching The Simpsons, comedy writer anyway. And had such a huge impact. So those, all those ideas and rhythms and sensibility are going to be just in your brain. But yeah, now then you also combine South Park, and then there's just so much Futurama TV that, and Family Guy. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and so yeah, that that would happen. All I mean, you know, you you keep you try to push the idea until it feels like it's far enough away from the original, from whatever someone called out. I mean, you know, we, we got really bummed out in the first season because we did like a dream episode. I, I referenced it earlier, Lawnmower Dog, where there's sort of an inception Terry and, and the guy and, and they go into like someone's brain and they run into scary Terry, who's a Freddy Krueger knockoff. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like got a family, like a wife and a kid. And it's like, oh, isn't that ironic? But then we were already, it was already being animated when one of the writers said, oh, you know, there's that South Park episode where they do an Inception parody and they run into Freddy Krueger and Freddy Krueger also ironically has a family. And we're like, why didn't you say anything? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's we're going to so look funny. like such hacks. That's crazy. And, and that's so, a you know, crazy coincidence. Yeah. So you, you, it's hard. You have to just like basically keep mutating 
the idea until it, it it's a, a different enough species that people go like, oh, I didn't even think of that. But, you know, we, we did that which there's an episode where the guys go into like a microverse and then a miniverse, you know, they keep going to these concentric smaller and smaller worlds. And we, when that idea started, it was like, this is way too similar to the episode of Simpsons, the Treehouse of Horrors, where Lisa's tooth grows like a bacterial colony that evolves into like an entire species that in a civilization. And then they, they, they develop into like, you know, a phase where they have spaceships that are flying around chasing Bart. And like originally that episode was just too similar to that. We're like, this is way, this just feels like that episode. Yeah. And so we had to change it. Hey, one other thing about uh, the Simpsons, Ryan, Al Jean um, grew up in the area, um, mm-hmm. similar area to you. We actually, Mike and I worked at Jean's hardware for yeah. a couple of years. Uh, but I wonder huh. if you have any personal connection to Al and um, you know, whether he was any sort of mentor or connection to you with respect to these shows. Well, geez, I didn't know he grew up in Metro Detroit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Farmington Hills. Where did he go to school? Harrison. Harrison. Yeah. He, okay. It, so, yeah. I Where is that? Where, when, what, what Farm, Farmington that? Hills. Farmington Hills. Okay. Yeah. No, I know. Cool. I mean, I've never met him personally, but obviously, you know, The Simpsons has, we did a, uh, we collaborated with, with them on a, on a, on a Simpsons couch gag you know, a couple of years ago, Rick and Morty came in and killed the Simpsons and the cold and the opening credits. Of yeah. That, yeah I remember and that. then, uh, they just did a shout out to the Szechuan sauce, like a reference to that and in, in a regular, in an episode. Szechuan and so there's sauce. obviously, and like, you know, animation is a really small world compared to the, you know, live action or just entertainment in general. So everybody not only just knows each other, but like people, Oh, we have people working in the Simpsons that, that, that work, you know, that go back and forth between Rick and Morty and the Simpsons. And our line producer was the line producer of the Simpsons. And so there's always some kind of connection, but I've never met Al personally. I've just heard, you know, I know a lot of people who know him and yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting. Maybe one of these days I'll meet him at a party or something. Hey, you know, that reminds me, do you have any thoughts or opinion on kind of the shit that Apu was going through these days? You know, I don't know if you saw that, but there's there's a documentary made about Apu that Indian actors are all pissed off that, you know, it was He's it, so stereotypical. Yeah, so stereotypical. You know, thank you, come again. You know, like and and so every Indian yeah. kid growing up had to deal with you know Apu comments or Quickie Mart references and kind of hindered them. Yeah, like, yeah. I I don't know if you have any opinion on that, but yeah, I mean, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's Indian the other day, and and I actually asked her about that. She wasn't aware of that, but, you know, she mentioned the Master of None episode, I don't know if you've seen that, which dealt with the Indian accent stereotype in in movies and TV, and they touched upon Apu and Fisher Stevens and Short Circuit and all these caricatures, and it's so funny because, yeah, I mean, growing up, it's just like, this is is everything we're, we're going through in this day. Like, the truth is, as a white guy, like, I was just like, oh, what's wrong with that? I don't, you just don't yeah. even think about it, you know? And it took me until my ex-girlfriend is Japanese and she was like the only Asian person in her uh, school in Boston and she got picked on a lot and bullied just for being Asian. And, and she, we talking about um, Big Trouble in Little China. I'm like, I love that movie. She's like, that movie's super offensive. <laughs> I'm like, what? I don't, under, how could, what are you talking about? <laughs> And then I, yeah. she explained, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not Asian, so I'm not looking at these absurd Asian stereotypes. It's <laughs> offensive. So, yeah, I, it, it, like, you know, my Indian friend, you know, was like, yeah, it's 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 really annoying to continue to see these Indian actors, like, having, that are, that are American, you know, that are born in America doing, like, that accent in every single role. And yeah. I have a friend, this, my friend, you know, Kumail, who actually, he's from Pakistan. He does have that accent, not, not that accent, but you know, <laughs> she has an accent. Yeah. And I remember she told me, she said, cause she, he's in, um, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. Goes, oh, Place to thing, yeah. And he goes, the only, she goes, well, the only thing that bothers you about that character is that the accent, I go, well, that's actually his accent. <laughs> but you know, even yeah. he said at one point, you know, Kumail was like, I just, it's just all these roles of like, oh, you, you do the accent. They're like, really juice it up. You know, come yeah. on. <laughs> and and, and African American actors have to deal with that, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, I'm sure gay actors have to deal with that. And it's just, it's like, we're, and, and look, I see, I'm, as a writer, you go like, well, you know, it's all about the broad strokes and you kind of want, you, totally. you're, it's all archetypes. And, and there's a fine, there's, it's a 
quick jump between archetype and stereotype. And also, also we should be challenging these things. And there's, there's so many ways that, you know, a character can be depicted, you know, but they're yeah. always depicted as the same thing. And that's the problem. It's a tough topic because if you're trying to be funny, uh, you know how to be funny and it's, it's bruising other people to do that in a lot of cases. And so, you know, and if you, if you really dive into the Simpsons, Jay and I have talked about it on our show. I mean, you could go down the list of characters on the Simpsons and they're basically stereotypes of whatever, of a, of a clergyman, of a cop, of a black guy, of a Mexican. I mean, they're all those broad strokes that you're talking about. So it's, I don't know, it's an interesting yeah. discussion, but it's, it is what it is. Yeah, that is the other end of it is, is like, wait, everybody kind of is a target, you know, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's up to the people that, that are, you know, once again, my girlfriend always said, she was like, listen to the minority when they're complaining, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we tend to go like, ah, I think the majority knows what we're talking about, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, of course, for the majority. <laughs> yeah, stop whining over there. Um, you guys got some amazing voice actors or, or just actors in general Really early on, I mean, you've got Par Chris Parnell, obviously. Parnell is awesome. He's amazing. Show. But I'm like, wait a minute, that's John Oliver. Oh, that's Dana Carvey. That's Stephen Colbert. That's Nathan, uh, I can't remember his last one, from Nathan For You. Yeah, yeah he's, uh, who's hilarious, by the way. And then I think you've got Keegan-Michael uh, Key on. I don't know who, and I'm sure you've gotten a ton more. How did you guys land yeah. such, such big names, even early on in the show? You know, I think it's so funny how people get actors on shows because when I was young growing up in Detroit, which is my first plug of the fact that I'm connected to Detroit at all. Hell yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, um, I, I, you know, even though my dad owned this comedy club, so I was pretty connected to show business compared to almost everybody else around me growing up. I still didn't really understand, especially how TV and movies work. And you just sort of look at it from the outside as like this big club where they're on one side of the wall and you're on the outside and they all know each other and are all friendly. And it's like, the truth is just because something's on TV, it doesn't mean any actor is going to want to do it. And so the, you know, sometimes it's simple as it's like, let's just go auditioning and casting and send, you know, I, I, th I think it's easy for a series. Like you can get a guy like Chris Parnell. I mean, Brian Cranston was almost the dad. It was almost wow. Jerry and um, and Rick Morty. Cause you're like, Hey, here's a regular role. That's going to be a regular paycheck. And it's easy for these guys to go in. But for these guest roles, you know, a lot of times it was personal relationships. So Dan Guterman, who was one of my favorite people in the world and such a brilliant writer and really like my creative soulmate in a lot of ways, uh, he came out of the show, uh, came out of community and then to Rick and Morty, but he was at Colbert for a long time. So he worked with Stephen okay. Colbert and he just basically just like reached out to him and was like, Hey, can you do a voice in the show? It was the episode he wrote and the microverse episode. And he also, Dan also was Canadian. So he knew Nathan Fielder from back in the day. So he yeah. reached out to him. And so it's shocking how many times that these are just like, Oh, can you kind of do me a favor, you know? And, and, you know, when you're working with talented people, those people usually work with other talented people. And so it's just about calling in those favors a lot. Lastly, you wrote for community starring Joel McHale, Chevy Chase, Ken Jong, Jack Black, just to name a few. Um, we've always heard what a tremendous asshole Chevy Chase is. Um, do, uh -huh. <laughs> do you do you have any opinion on that? I mean, is that do you do you rem I, don't, I don't know. I thought he had a falling out with Community too, but go ahead just, and tell us what an asshole yeah, he is, please. You know, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll say this. I I never worked uh, personally with Chevy Chase, but you heard he was he was, he was gone um, by the time I got onto Community. Or actually, we we it was the season. Yeah, we we sort of wrote one episode in season five that that he was on as a hologram, but his character had been killed off <laughs> um, off screen, and uh, and so I don't know. I just have to like take everyone's word for it. But you know, my one interaction with Chevy Chase was I was visiting the set of community in like season two, I think, and because I've been friends with Dan for years, and actually it was Justin and I both visiting the set together hanging out and uh and and, and they're shooting this halloween episode and i was on the set of the study room and i was such a huge fan of the show even being friends with dan i was just a fan of the show and so it was so exciting to me to be on the set and stuff and i'm still a little bit like oh my god a hollywood studio you know paramount yeah. and uh and so uh joel and dan were introducing me to chevy you know yeah you're doing nice to meet you and then they had whatever issues they had with them already after two seasons 
And they kind of started goofing on him by going like, hey, remember that old uh, land shark that you used to do? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he starts doing the land shark bit. And it really was like they were essentially like kind of picking on him. Like they were like, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the, the, the pilot of Freaks and Geeks, but, but Ben Foster plays a retarded kid. And when you introduce that character, there's like two bullies going like, Hey, so uh, uh, are you going to be president one day? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be president. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And are you going to you going to date a date a, date a hot cheerleader? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to oh, date a hot no. cheerleader. And, and that was kind of what they were doing in Chevy Chase by getting him to do the land shark bit. And so he's doing the land shark bit when like like Calgram, and they're like kind of looking at each other side eyed and smirking. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. To me, this is incredible. I'm watching Chevy Chase do the land shark. Yeah, bit. yeah, I, yeah I, that's I, hilarious. He's being made fun of. The oh, how how sad. Yeah. So um, that's that's my defense of Chevy Chase. I don't. I have that was a perfectly pleasant, ex- wonderful experience. <laughs> hey, lastly, uh, Justin, when he voices, uh, he does vo- Rick and Morty, right? Yeah, he, he's the voice of both. When he does Rick's voice, he's playing this drunk the whole time. Does he have to burp after every line he says, or can you guys insert those later? I, I I'm never sure. I think it's I think it's sometimes that they do those later, and so, like they have a. I always hear like they God, what do they call it? Like a there's some term when we have like a an archive, a library of like oh, it's a Beth scream, a Jerry scream, a Rick burp. You know the stuff that you can just use, you can yeah. recycle. But I know that Justin does like to get in there with his light beer and, and do, like, as many real-time takes as he can burping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know ultimately how they use, you know, what they use in the final cut, you yeah. know. Well, Ryan, we've taken a lot of your time, man. It's Ryan Ridley, writer, producer, voice actor for Rick and Morty is really what we're talking about today. Well, what, what's next for you? We'll what's, see ya. what's next for you? Uh, uh, getting my own show. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I, I'm, I would be shocked if you weren't trying to write your own thing. Yeah, remember remember earlier in the conversation we said being the executive producer, getting more money and yeah, power yeah, yeah. is the goal? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so <laughs> there's only that. one way to do be, that. Being the creator. Create show. Yeah, being the creator is even yeah. more money. Yeah, it's, 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 it's frustrating. It's, I always say it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. So There you go. We'll see. Well, yeah. Ryan, thank you so, for so much for the time, man. It's Ryan Ridley. You can follow him on Twitter at, at Ryan Ridley or uh, on Instagram, yeah. Ry- Ryan Ridley on Instagram. And uh, sure. funny, funny dude. We we absolutely adore your father, man. I've known him, like I said, for damn near twenty years. So um, next time you're in Detroit, man, pop on by and say hi to us. Will do. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thank All right, you thank- so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. And keep us uh, okay. uh, keep us updated if you get anything that uh, you want us to promote. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Take thank care. you, man. All right. Take care. Bye. 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 Your